Hogwarts Castle, a 5 inch gauge locomotive. This is part 34, reassembling the front bogey. This front bogey assembly was one of the first parts I removed from the locomotive and I featured it in an earlier episode. I took it back to the steam workshop and Dave at the steam workshop painted it. In this clip I'm showing how the suspension parts fasten on. This is a type of balanced suspension and there's an interaction between where the position of all the wheels are when it's running. Each side has a beam like this that sits on two compression springs which press down on the top of the axle boxes. You can see how it works in this clip when I'm pressing it with my fingers. There are two of these beams which will be fitted later once they've been painted. But for now I'm removing this one and I'm going to paint it. I removed the original paint using cellulose thinners or lacquer thinner. There's still a bit of primer left on one of them, the other one's quite clean. I'm scratching the surface using some scotch Bright just to key it for the paint. Here are both of the beams sat on a piece of wood in the outer part of the workshop and I'm spraying them with some etch primer. Even though one of the beams already has some primer on, I thought etch primer's the way to go. As usual, to do this job, I'm using Auto Paint Northern Etching Primer. This is grey etching primer. And just in case you can't see the phone number, it's 01924 410125. When I took the bogey back to the steam workshop, I refixed the keeper plates on the horn blocks so that they could be painted at the same time, all as one unit. David, the steam workshop used some masking tape on the bearing part of the horn blocks. And in this clip, I'm removing the masking tape using a craft knife. Sometimes when I paint parts like this, I don't bother masking the horn blocks. I just scrape off the paint after it's dried using a ruler. Now it's time to fit the wheel sets into the horn blocks. These wheel sets were marked and numbered, but I never noticed that, so I'm doing it the hard way. I'm trying the wheel sets in one position, then if that's no good, turning them round until I find one that is very free, like this one. Usually when I reassemble moving parts, I lubricate them first, but not so in this case because I need to paint the axles, and I don't want any oil between the junction of the axles and the axle boxes. At the moment I'm tightening the bolts that hold the keeper plates onto the horn blocks. These are also numbered so you can put them back in the right place. In this clip I'm cleaning the first axle using some Scotch Bright, ready for the paint. And now it's time to move on to the other one, first of all removing the masking tape from the horn blocks. In exactly the same way as I did for the first set of horn blocks, I'm using a craft knife to get behind the masking tape to lift it off. On this side some of the paint had got underneath the masking tape, so I scraped that off with the craft knife as well. And as before, I tried the axle boxes in the horn blocks, first one way round, then the other way round, until I found the one that was the most free. It's really important that the axle boxes do not stick in the horn blocks when the engine is running on the track. If an axle box was to stick in one of the horn blocks, then a derailment would probably occur, and this is the last thing that you want. If you're building an engine from scratch, make sure that you have a bit of play between the axle boxes and the horn blocks, so they become a very smooth sliding fit. And now, without a word of warning, it's painting time. I would think by now a few viewers were thinking, why did he fit the wheel sets before he painted the axles? The answer is quite simple, because it's much easier to rotate the wheels when they're like this, than it is when you have the wheels in your hands, trying to make sure that the axle boxes do not slide down the axle after you've painted them. As you can see, by rotating the axle and holding the brush still, you can get a perfect line without painting half of the axle box as well, and it just makes the job a whole lot easier. As the axles are in bare metal, I'm repainting the axles using Auto Paint Northern Etching Primer, the same stuff that you've just seen me spray on the suspension. This is great stuff, it's a really good etching primer, it does what it says on the tin. I usually leave 24 hours for etching primer to dry before the top coats. And here's the first, in fact, the only top coat I'm going to use. I'm painting what I term on the drip here. Really, I'm putting a lot of paint on, but not enough for it to run or sag. Just enough to get a nice even coverage. This is Humbrol Enamel Red. And this seems to be the traditional colour for painting axles, inside valve gear and motion, and sometimes it's used for painting in between the frames. I decided not to paint in between the frames red, I left it in black. 
Normally I would quickly compose some music and play it in the video sequences when I'm painting, but in this case there's not that much painting so there isn't time to do that. Instead I will tell you what happened yesterday, which was Sunday. A couple of weeks ago I received an email from a viewer who told me that one of the members of his family had died and left him a steam engine in his will. Anyway, in due course, the chap arrived with his steam engine, and it was a really nice steam engine, a 3.5 inch gauge 9F Evening Star. So he took it out of his car and put it on the bench to have a look at it. The idea being that he wanted me to give him a price for making it runnable again. It hadn't been run for 20 years or more. And I had a close look at this engine, and initially I thought, well, it looks okay. Then I explained that to get the boiler tested, a boiler tester would want to see the boiler outside the model, because you cannot tell the physical condition of a boiler and how well or how badly it's made when it's inside a wrapper inside the model. I then explained that it could potentially cost a lot of money to make the engine fit for service in a public place. I was watching the viewfinder on the camera, and that's why I painted the wrong bit, just in case you wonder why I did that. I had a look at the parts of the boiler that I could physically see the back head and around the foundation ring. And both these important areas of the boiler looked very good. More than good enough to allow some low pressure air into the boiler to see whether the motion worked. As I looked over this engine in greater detail before doing any of this though, I noticed that it was very well made, it was engineer built, you can tell. You can tell when a model is built really badly and when one is built okay. And the man who brought the engine for me to look at said that when he was a child he used to ride round the track with his uncle on this engine. And then because of the ill health and subsequent death of his uncle, the model had been used for display purposes and had been stationary for 20 to 21 years. I connected a compressed air line to the blowdown valve, which is a very good place to put any air into a boiler to start with. I just used the usual piece of silicone rubber tubing pressed onto the end of the blowdown valve's outlet, and then I admitted some air to see what happened. Not much really, the pressure went up to about £20 per square inch, which is not a lot. One side of the drain cocks were blowing badly, and even with the regulator shut, there was compressed air coming out of the drain cocks on the cylinders. Then it was time to lubricate everything, so I oiled every moving part that I could see, all of the wheels, and because this was an evening star, a 210O, that's a lot of wheels to oil. And as I went round the engine, I did notice it was very well made indeed, the engineering standard was very high. The regulator didn't work, it wouldn't shut off. That explained why the air was blown out of one of the drain cocks. Before trying to run the engine on compressed air, I wanted to have a look at the state of the lubrication of the cylinders and under the front was the mechanical lubricator, but this wasn't working, it had seized up. So instead I injected some oil via the drain cocks into the cylinders, because it's no good running cylinders that have sat for 20 years without any oil. I slowly turned up the air pressure to £30 per square inch, because the boiler hadn't blown up at £20 per square inch, and the wheels slowly started to turn, and very slowly they started turning, then gathered speed, and then suddenly the engine ran perfectly, and I thought to myself, well, I didn't think that was going to happen, and ran just as well in reverse once I wound back the reverser as it did in forward gear. The paintwork of the engine is, well, workmanlike. It was not brilliantly painted, but it must have looked good when it was new. So am I going to take on this commission to fix this engine up? No. And why not? Well, it would just take too long and therefore be very expensive for the customer and it would make the most boring video series in the world after a while. I would have taken on the job had it have been an 040 engine with less wheels, but not when it's got 10, or 12 if you include the leading pair. It would be a case of, hello and welcome to episode 138 of Rebuilding a 3.5 inch gauge Evening Star 210O model steam locomotive. It would just take far too much time and money to do it. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.